and have a look around. Um, so my topic today is, is really looking at um, moving to a non-mules uh, merino enterprise in, in the rangelands. Um, but clearly there's got to be a focus on lifetime welfare and on productivity. You've got to blend all of those issues in, into the same one. And clearly it's a really complex issue. It's not something that can really be fully addressed in, in half an hour. So I'm really um, just sort of touching the water and giving an overview of, of what's involved. Critically, rangelands country is so variable and what will work in one part of the rangelands won't work in another rangelands. And, and one of the themes of today has been got to understand your country, got to understand the interaction between the sheep and the country, the genetics, the country, and then what that country, this type of sheep that that country will produce. So it's an overwhelming thing about working out what's right for you and what's right for you is not necessarily right for your neighbour or someone else in a, in a different area. Um, just very briefly, I'll give a, a quick view of the history of fly strike in the country, quick recap of the causes of fly strike, a bit about the effect of mulesing, um, a bit of the, tool, the tools in the toolbox to control fly strike, a um, bit of evidence of uh, improving merinos in terms of their profitability and also their natural breed strike resistance, some of the concerns about moving to non-mulesing and, and a lot of those can come out of this survey that was done a couple of years ago and there's a few um, of these up the back, um, steps to go non-mules and, and then more information. Um, so the, the fly came into Australia, so it's an interest, you know, introduced species. Um, just before the fly came in, we brought in the Vermonts from the US and they were heavily wrinkled animals. It was a, quite a quick fad and a lot of those animals were then cut out in the early 2005s. But it was about the 1890s where the fly came into Australia. It took 40 or 50 years to to spread across Australia and, and largely in the Macquarie area and here was around the First World War that the fly, um, fly moved in, but it took that 40 years. The, the last state was, uh, was Tassie to, to receive the fly. Um, the mulesing was invented in the early um, 1930s um, and it was around the, the removal of this excess skin that we'd brought in largely um, with the Vermonts, but also it was already existing in the, in the Saxons as well. Um, there was already less mulesing in um, Queensland and Tasmania. The adoption was slower in those states and largely because both in Tassie and in Queensland there's less risk of fly strike in those environments. Tassie because it's colder and the intensity and the duration of the fly strike period is less, much like New Zealand. And, and it's different again in, in Queensland because of the heat. So quite different. But in, in South Australia, um, I started jackarooing there in uh, 78 and whatever, and the 1977 drop of the Bungaree rams was the last drop to be nun mules. So I looked after them going through and there were still clients that would come in on Bungaree and they really would, did want to see them unmulesed and they would have a look at them, spy them and select them unmules. It was really still quite important for them. But there was a lot of push by departments of ag and by a whole range of people to go uh, mulesing and then Bungaree then started mulesing in, um, in 79. But, and a lot of growers in the pastoral country in South Australia started mulesing because they saw that that was the push and that was the need. But over time they realised that they didn't actually need to have quite as big as mules as what was originally did. They actually reduced the size of the mules and then a lot of them actually went back to just doing tail stripping. So, so that even, even in the early days when, when mulesing was being heavily advocated in the 70s and 80s, there were significant differences between regions. The blowfly um, entered New Zealand in about the 80s and they also too jumped into mulesing and then slowly realised that the risk of fly strike in, the, in that country, in that environment, was lessened so, so they slowly reduced mulesing and then it was finally ceased in, in 2018. But, but since the 80s we've had this emergence of the animal welfare and the rights groups um, but there's also been a considerable change in the economics of the rangelands. There's a lot of labour's been gone out. The sheep type, the merino type has changed in the 80s and earlier that we were sort of live export weathers, then we went into fine wools. Um, and so the, the sheep has changed as well as labour has changed and the markets between meat and wool has changed. 
Then we've had some new technology that's come along that's enabled us to try and bend the curve between fleece weight and wrinkle. Um, and then increasingly we've had, uh, even we've had over time, resistance to chemicals, uh, whether that be diazinon or, or the more recent ones as well. So growers have had to blend in all these changings along the way. Um, how to risk the, the, the risk of breach strike? It's really low dags, low stain, low breach wrinkle, um, low wall, wall cover, so a bigger bare area at the back, and, and it's wall colour as well. The wider walls get less struck. And growers have a range of ways in which they can do that. You can either do it through breeding, um, can do it through crutching, um, proving worm control, long-term worm control to reduce dags. That's less of an issue in, in this country, obviously, than others. Um, but it's also prevention chemicals. And there's a huge variety of ways that growers across Australia manage all these tools in their toolbox to do this. Some growers in Queensland don't even need to, to crutch and they can still manage um, fly, you know, reasonable control with, with, without even crutching. So it's, it's entirely variable. But one of the, through research and discussion with a lot of growers and whatever, overwhelmingly what it is is to try and get the risk of fly strike down. It's got to be DAGs is two score or less, urine stain two score or less, wrinkles two score or less, and then the cover three score and less. Once you've, if, if you're not in DAG country, and it's the southern part of Australia is, in, is the high DAG country, here and north is, is relatively low DAG country, um, once you've got your wrinkle down, you've got your dags down, you're staying down, then, then wool cover becomes increasingly important. In terms of risk of dags, now this, this uh, work was done in Armidale, and we've, we've done it in Armidale, they were super fine sheep, it was high rainfall area, and they have quite an extensive risk of fly strike, um, the period. So, but, but the relatively, relative ranks of the risk of these traits is the same whether it, it's in South Australia, rangelands, um, or, or in, even in Armidale. So, so think about the relativity. But here, here in Armidale, you know, DAG score one is a low risk. And then as you go up to, to DAG f score five in Armidale, so it's 135%. So animals were getting restruck. If they were DAG score five, you would treat them and then they were getting restruck again. So, so DAGs is a high risk. Less of a risk here because, um, relatively speaking, you, you have low DAGs. In terms of urine stain, urine stain, the risk for strike is similar to DAGs. It's around moisture at the, the rear end of, of um, female ewes, um, which develops the, increases the risk of fly strike. Um, wrinkles around 70% once you get to, to the wrinkle score five. Um, actually in Armidale, even though the risk of strike from DAGs and urine stain was high, because they had really little incidence of it, DAGs and urine stain didn't cause a great deal of the fly strike. Wrinkles did. Even though the incidence, the, the, the risk of strike was less, because they had a lot more three, four and five score, wrinkle score animals in that in area, overwhelmingly it was wrinkle that's caused the strike in that area. Uh, bridge cover, um, less, again these are the fine walls so there's less variation in, in breach cover, um, but it was down to around 30%. Once you get into low dag, low wrinkle animals in the pastoral zone, breach cover does tend to, to take a higher priority. But the rankings are, are largely around the same. And this is wool colour, this was out of Western Australia where the wrinkle um, was, was low and so there as the uh, yellow colour in the wool increased, so, so also did the risk of breech strike, but also clearly body strike goes up as well. This is out of WA, um, where we had both horns and poles in, in the research flock. Um, the poles obviously having showing less horn strike um, than, than the horns. Now, I mean, a lot of this depends on the setting of the horns, and if they're spread wide apart, then there's less strike. Um, if they're sitting close, then, the, then there's greater strike. There has been a move in, in Australia over the recent decades and there's a significant increase in polls. So nationally it's around 66%, but South Australia's, uh, you know, 90% plus has, has moved to polls. But strike really does vary between years and you can see here the incidence of strike 
burying. It depended about whether they were crutched uh, or uncrutched at a, at a normal time. But here you can also see these are sire groups, the different coloured bars between those, the, the years. Um, so there was large variations in the incidence of strike depending on who their sire was. So all the dams were, were, were random, but it was significant, significant variation there on, between the sire progeny groups. What we also did in some of these trials is, is we looked at how quickly could we reduce the risk of fly strike from breeding. And so we had a control line where they bred amongst themselves, so there was actually no selection pressure. We had a commercial line where there was just selection pressure on the sires, an intense line where we selected for both the sires and the, and the ewes. And within a reasonable short space of time, there was a significant reduction through breeding in terms of the risk of strike. And so within those five years, the um, selected line um, was about the same, unmules was about the same as the, the risk of strike in the mules control line. So we had a significant increase over the five years in terms of being able to reduce the risk of strike. But one of the issues that had there was we brought all these sheep that were outside the area that were not true to type for that area and we ended up with a whole heap of body strike. But we were able to show that in a very quick space of time we were able to reduce the risk of breach strike. But what we also showed was when we selected for low breech wrinkle and then we mules those animals, we pretty well obliterated the risk of strike. And so this also shows that breeding works, but then if you, you select them for lower wrinkle, then the mulesing has a significant impact on, on top of that. We, were, we showed from these trials that mulesing reduced the breech wrinkle by about one score. It reduced the urine stain by about half a score and it reduced the DAG score by about 0.4. So that, that showed the, sort of the effectiveness of mulesing. Really what we're looking to do is so we know mulesing works and whatever, can we now start to breed an animal and get to an animal um, whereby we can get similar rates of risk of strike, um, not through mulesing but, but by breeding. So I should also point here that, that this was in a really low DAG area. So here we really showed the effectiveness of mulesing and, and breeding in terms of reducing the risk of strike. Once you go down into the high DAG areas, despite them being mules, if you have a lot of DAGs, the DAGs will override the, the mulesing and so you will get uh, a significant amount of strike irrespective of whether they were mules or not. But this, this was data taking in, in low DAG country. What I've done here is, is I've looked at, this, these were figures from AWEX and this is the, the National Wool Declaration, and it's by Micron. So you'll see there on the left, there are all of the bales that were 18, less than 18.6 microns, then it was 18.6 to 20.5, and then we're going up in micron categories. categories. More than 24.5 is regarded as crossbred, under 20.5 is regarded as merino, and then the total. So, so here you can see that um, you know, in terms of the non-mulesed bales, around 6% of, of the total non-mulesed bales of the 140,000 bales was in that 20.6 to 22.5, and another 6% was, was in the next category higher. So that's tending to be most of the range rangelands, and you'll see the ceased mules there as well. So, you know, relatively speaking, there's less wool coming out of these, these micron categories than there is in the fine wool because there's the significant push in the finals because it's next of skin, because that's where the demand is coming out of the, uh, of the supply chain. And those growers largely are being able to do it um, by additional crutching, um, by additional chemical application. Um, and they're being able to, to achieve it that way. But looking at it a, a, a little bit differently, of the 31,000 bales that are in that 22.5 to 24.5 micron category, 28% of the bales in that category are actually non-mulesed. Um, it's a relatively small, just 2% within that broad merino category at 2%. So you can see here that in the fine walls, it's only about 13% is non-mulesed. 
um, going to 7%, 8%, then to 28% and 34% in, in the really the crossbred wools. So where is this wool coming from? So overwhelmingly it's coming from Queensland because a lot of the areas in those rangelands country and um, it is the risk of fly strike is considerably less. So um, as I was saying about Tasmania and Queensland have the least um, amount of mulesing going on and that's invariably because of the risk of fly strike uh, in, those, in those environments. You can see here that the declaration rate is, is lower in these, in these stronger rules than in, than in other categories. So I was just talking in terms about how to go about controlling fly strike. Um, it's selection, it's crutching, it's improved DAG control. Uh, it was interesting, Stacey was talking about DAGs, but overwhelmingly in the rangelands, DAGs and worms aren't an issue. DAGs might be an issue one in 10 years or when there's a sudden change in, in feed, but relatively speaking to the southern areas, it's low DAG country and, and chemical prevention. And the use of the frequency of these tools in the toolbox varies enormously between, between regions, um, as, you, as you can see there. But the issue really confronting growers whereby there's, there's this request from the supply chain about non mules about can you improve your lifetime welfare, look after the lifetime welfare of your animals, can you get non mules and can you produce profitable sheep at, at the same time. So yes, you know, going from the, the data we have, ram breeders are increasingly breeding a profitable um, fly resistant animal. In recent decades, one of the associations with low wrinkle was low fleece weight. And so there were breeders that were able to significantly reduce the wrinkle and therefore the risk of fly strike, but they also had a lower fleece weight. Um, but this is changing and that's particularly so f for the medium wolves. Breeding, breeding for low wrinkle and high fleece weight can be achieved visually because you can both see and feel both wrinkle and, and fleece weight, so it can get done. And I'm just about to put up some information that come from breeding values because breeding values provide me the data to give you the evidence, um, whereas a, a sort of visual assessment um, can't really do it in a PowerPoint. But one, also one of the other things that's been happening in merinos for the last 15 years is that there's been an increasing number of traits that merino breeders have been breeding for. Um, Stacey spoke a little bit about fat and muscle. Um, worm mag count's not an issue here, um, but in some of the wool growing areas where they've really selected for worm mag count, if they were having to drench for four times a year, that sometimes they're down to, to two times a year through, through breeding for it. Um, but significantly, the number of traits that we're, we're selecting for has been increasing, and particularly also in the rangelands where the need to try and breed increased resilience um, and ability for the animal to respond to hard times uh, and, and to revert to, to normal states, its ability to sort of recover is pretty important. So that's why sort of fat and muscle have also been increasing to try and build an animal a little bit more resilient to to nutritional environments that are not quite so challenged as, as, as to other areas. And while the progress can be made a little bit more, more so with the medium wools, um, it's very much more difficult in the Saxons and the fine wools, and I'll show you, show you that a little bit uh, in coming slides. Um, so what I've done here, and, and here you, um, there was a comment about breeding values before, um, yes, they're, they're really quite technical. Um, they have been around for quite a few decades and principally the intensive livestock industries um, got heavily involved in it after the Second World War and the sort of sheep and cattle in Australia have really got into it for the last 20 or 30 years. And so the technology really has, has developed. Um, the best way, I, I, the way I see it is, is the technology works in terms of implementing the technology and understanding all the limitations about what breeding values are. And once you understand the limitations of them, then you can actually use the technology in, in, in its best way. So there's all sorts of, of you know, um, caveats around, around the technology, but it, but it does work. 
So what I've done here is I've just gone in and I've looked at some of the AI size that are, that are available, and this is these here are on the Merino Select website. So ACF is adult clean fleece weight, um, and the, the blue shadings are those animals that are in the top 10% of the, uh, I think it's nearly sort of 3 million animals, 3 million Merinos that are in, in that database. And you can see there, so this animal of the 16 drop is, is top 10% fleece weight, but it's also minus 1.4 on wrinkle, minus 0.3 on cover, and minus 0.3 on dag. So, so it's top 10% dag, top 10% wrinkle, it's also top 10% adult fleece weight. So these animals are starting to come through. Admittedly, yes, these are AI size, um, um, but industry is, is off madly trying to breed these animals. You can also see here a 17 drop animal that's, that's plus 40% on, on fleece weight, minus 1.1 on wrinkle score and, and is high in index. And you can see animals in there that are also high on, on number of lambs weaned. So industry, industry is out there breeding them um, and, and every year as the further AI sires are actually come through and are getting progeny tested, you can see the evidence of, of what ram breeders are doing in, in, in breeding these type of animals. In, in terms of the target wrinkle score that people in rangelands need, it, it heavily depends on your country, which is a bit of the theme that's today. But the significant number of, of commercial uh, wool growers in rangelands country that minus 0.3 of wrinkle minus 0.3 uh, wrinkle in the breeding value will generate you all of your progeny to wrinkle score or less. So the significant areas where you only need to go to a wrinkle score of minus 0.3, and that's invariably because they're low nutrition areas. You just don't have the follicle, the, the skin, um, the build up of the additional skin in the lamb and then in, well, while it's in its early stages of lactating. A bit like in a drought, the lambs will be um, plainer than, than in a big year when the, you'll have a lot more wrinkle. That plays out across Australia. So there's plenty of non-mules studs and their clients in rangelands area where it's minus 0.3 is enough. But clearly there's also other rangelands area where you've got to actually go to minus one in terms of a breeding score, breeding um, ASBV, a wrinkle ASBV. You've got to go to minus one before the lambs that you then breed at home are all wrinkle score one and two and under. So it's understanding what your country is and what your target scores need to be is, is a critical thing in setting, setting you up. Um, also, the, the cover um, you know, uh, has, has an impact as well once you've got your wrinkle down low. Um, then you've also got to then start setting targets in terms of production. And I've put in one here is, say, adult fleece weight is plus 25%. Um, but setting, setting the targets about what you, the breeding values you need to, to go home to produce the animal that is most profitable and naturally fly strike resistant in, in your country. You can see here that these are all high micron animals, 0.6, minus 0.5, minus 1, minus 0.7. Um, so these animals, these high fleece weight, low wrinkle animals are available in these high micron animals but you can also see the, f the weight there, the yearling weight is really quite high. So these are big animals with high microns and they won't suit everyone. Now ram breeders are mainly trying to take some fibrodimer off these animals and also uh, take some of the weight off them. Um, but this is some of the natural genetics that has come through from high fleece weight, uh, low wrinkle animals. And it'll take time then to, to correct some of the traits that may or may not uh, interest you. This next slide, um, I've gone down a, a micron, so I've gone down sort of one and a half microns, and you can see th these group of AI sires are minus 1.8 in fibre diameter, minus 1.7, minus 1.4, minus 1.8. So I've taken a, a good one and a half or two microns off and then tried to find the leading size. Um, and so yeah, there you can see we've come back on f and fleece weight, but we've also come back on the wrinkle score um, not quite so much on cover, but also the DAG score. So once you go down in micron, it's harder to find these quite low wrinkle, um, low DAG animals. And if you go down into the super fines, it's, it's even harder again, but, but they weren't really relevant to, to, this, to this audience. But then not only do, I mean, these are the leading AI size that industry are breeding. Then in terms of you, if you're a flock round buyer, 
you then need to go to those sort of studs that are on that breeding objectives and then you need to buy an even line of flock rams then to deliver the product you have. So, so these really are just the leading AI sides that industry are breeding. So it, it's going to take time then to, to expand that out through the flocks. From, from this uh, survey that, that we did um, of, of growers that have gone on mules, um, there was a lot of comments um, in, in response to this survey about what are the biggest concerns about going, going non mules and, and overwhelmingly it is, can I keep the risk of breach strike low enough um, and can I manage the low but constant incidence of breach strike when you move away fr um, into a non-mulesed um, enterprise? Is, is, is the risk of breach strike in my environment just too high? Can I get the incidence down? And, and is there just that annoying low level of strike um, going to be a, how, how do I manage that? Can I access labour, shearers and on-farm staff? And often we'll hear of um, growers saying, I, I can't access labour, um, I can't access shearers, or I can access shearers if they can go home at night, but if I'm too far out of town, I can't get shearers to shear my non mules animals. It, it's heavily variable. How do I manage a fly wave? How, what's the infrastructure in the property that I have? How do I manage surplus on the, disc, on the, the discounts on the non mules surplus sheep? Now, in some areas, you know, again, in Tassie and in, in Queensland, there's very limited discount on surplus unmulesed animals. But in other areas, you can take Katana, you can take here, you can take the Macquarie, there's, there's considerable discounts on them. And how do you best manage that in, with your marketing? Is everyone on board in the business? Um, What's the impact? How much chemical resistance do you have? And we're, we're noticing there's significant differences between regions about the amount of chemical resistance we have to the commonly used fly products at the moment. Um, and, and where do I go to get uh, assistance from fellow growers who have headed down this path? So, so principally, sort of what are the steps to move to a non-mules wall? How do you work out whether you're wanting to, to head down this path or not? Um, overwhelmingly, I think the first thing is you've got to get your sheep right first. And, and, and for the more medium wools, that can take a modest amount of time. Once you go into the fines and saxons, we're talking decades to get the, for, their, for those types of animals to get their wrinkle down, their productivity up. Um, short lambings tend to help um, because they reduce the time where you can't actually get in and um, uh, control fly strike if, if during lambing. Rotational grazing is, works in some areas and, and not in other areas. Um, do you have other enterprises or can I focus all of my time in on, on the wool growing enterprise? Can I still go away on leave or is the fly strike risk period when I want to go away on leave um, too high and I don't have the luxury to, to do that. So some, some take home messages, um, you know, natural low wrinkle on cover uh, can reduce the risk of breech strike, similar to mulesing. Um, but all sheep need to be low wrinkle and cover, not just the average. So everything has to be two or less wrinkle score, two or less dag, not, not the average. Set production targets and they need to be set for your country um, you, your uh, enterprise. Um, to go non-mules, it's plan, plan and plan, just, just don't stop. Um, and that's been overwhelmingly in, in these things, where errors that growers have made who have headed down that path um, and um, have then either gone back to mulesing or had to make some significant um, changes to their business. It's, it's seek advice. Um, but I think also one of the other things in terms of, I haven't got it on this list here, it's about getting your tail right. Um, so in, in low wrinkle areas, um, you know, overwhelmingly breech strike happens on the tail and, and not actually in the breech. When you go into high wrinkle spots, 90% of the breech strike happens in the breech, not the tail. So overwhelmingly 
um, it's tail strike that's caused us a problem. Um, and so docking it at a, at a right le length is, is really important. If you go too short, you, you can end up with increased urine stain, you end up with increased dags, and you end up with increased prolapses as well. Um, going too long, then you can cause the same problem as well. So, so tail docking is pretty important. Um, the other thing is also concentrate on adult fleece weight when you're tending to head down here because it's often those earlier maturing types when you're doing breeding values where their one year old fleece weight can be higher, but it's higher because they're um, early maturing type. So this is about understanding the limitations of breeding values. Really look at sort of what adult fleece weight is. Um, and then you also need to, to go and get a, a ram source that's, that's on your breeding objective. So there's a lot of information on the AWI website, um, and I just list, list those off. It's really quite extensive. This is quite a complex um, uh, topic, um, and there's a whole range of other websites as well. I just put this sire up here. Sort of, he's a 14 drop. Um, you know, he's minus 0.8 on wrinkle score. He's top 10 percent, top 20 percent on fleece weight. Um, he's also a trait leader on crutch, cover and on dags. Um, but this guy's largely been surpassed now as a leading AI sire. You know, to a leading AI sire, you know, there's plus 40 on adult fleece weight, there's minus one on, on wrinkle, there's plus almost two on fat. So it's, it's happening at a really quite a rapid rate at that elite end amongst the ram breeders. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jeff. We're almost on time. So, questions? Oh, I think it's nearly lunchtime. Yep. Thank you, Jeff. That was very informative. Thank you very much. OK, um, I'm just going to quickly, but just before lunch, we're just going to quickly call up Gus White. Gus is